In this video, we will try to understand the normal physiology of excitation contraction coupling in skeletal muscles. To understand excitation contraction coupling in skeletal muscles, we need to be familiar with voltage sensitive sodium channels in the skeletal muscle. Now, what you are looking at here is a voltage sensitive sodium channel from above. Now, this is the central pore of the voltage sensitive sodium channel. Now, let us make a slice through the voltage sensitive sodium channel, passing through the central pore and the two yellow dots which you see over there. If we slice through the voltage sensitive sodium channel in such a manner, this is what we would get. So, there is the voltage sensitive sodium channel, a cut section of it, embedded in the cell membrane of a skeletal muscle. Over there, you see the central pore, the same central pore which you saw when looking from above. <coughs> now, this voltage sensitive sodium channel has got two gates. That's the first gate, and it's called the activation gate. This would be the second gate called the inactivation gate. Now, each of these gates can exist in either one of the two states, namely the open state or the closed state. Depending on the state of both these gates, the voltage sensitive sodium channel itself can exist in three different conformations, namely the voltage sensitive sodium channel in the open state, the voltage sensitive sodium channel in the closed state, and the voltage sensitive sodium channel in the inactivated state. Now let's take a look at this voltage sensitive sodium channel. There's the activation gate, and there's the inactivation gate. Here, the activation gate is closed and the inactivation gate is opened. In such a situation, the voltage sensitive sodium channel is said to be in the closed state. Now, in the second situation, there is the activation gate and here is the inactivation gate. As you can see, the activation gate is opened and the inactivation gate is also open. In such a situation, the voltage sensitive sodium channel is said to be in the opened state. Now here, we can see the activation gate again and the inactivation gate over there. As you can see, the activation gate is opened and the inactivation gate is closed. It has blocked the central pole. In such a situation, the voltage sensitive sodium channel is said to be in the inactivated state. So, this is a summary of what we just discussed in the previous slides. Now, let us take a closer look at this voltage sensitive sodium channel. As you can see, it is embedded in the um, cell membrane of the skeletal muscle. And if you look at this voltage sensitive sodium channel, you can see those two yellow areas which are loaded with positive charges. And also, if you remember, the interior of a skeletal muscle is always negatively charged in resting state. This is the membrane potential in the resting state. It's called the resting membrane potential. And it is usually minus 90 in the case of a skeletal muscle. Now, the interior of the cell is highly negative. And we have all these positive charges loaded inside the voltage sensitive sodium channel. 
these opposite charges tend to attract each other and this keeps the voltage sensitive sodium channel in this particular conformation. Let us now extend this diagram and take a look at the neuromuscular junction. So there is the neuromuscular junction with the cholinergic neuron and the NM receptor, the nicotinic receptors. The voltage sensitive sodium channel is not exactly at the neuromuscular junction, it is in the perijunctional zone. Now when this cholinergic neuron gets stimulated, it releases two molecules of acetylcholine which changes the conformation of the NM receptor as you can see there. A cationic channel opens up and allows positive ions to enter the cell from the exterior. These ions are cationic, they are mostly sodium but could be calcium and other cations as well. It is a non-specific cationic channel. The point is positive charges do enter and when this happens, the negativity inside the cell reduces. It reduces to a point, even in the perijunctional zone, whereby the attractive forces that were exerted on the positive charges in the voltage, in the voltage sensitive sodium channel, no longer exist. Now the voltage within the cell changes from minus 90 to a threshold potential minus 40. That is what we call the end plate potential. Now once this happens, there are no longer sufficient negative charges to pull the positive charges in the voltage sensitive sodium channels and therefore they move upwards and the conformation of the voltage sensitive sodium channel gets changed. The activation gate begins to open up. And now you have a condition where the voltage sensitive sodium channel has its activation gate opened and the inactivation gate opened as well. This voltage sensitive sodium channel has just converted from the closed state to the opened state. Sodium ions rush into the cell. This takes the voltage from minus 40 straight upwards beyond zero to possibly even plus 40. Now, in a time dependent manner, the inactivation gate will swing shut like a ball and chain mechanism and it will block the central pore, preventing further entry of positive charges. At this stage, we see a plateau in the voltage. <clears throat> this is the voltage sensitive sodium channel in the inactive state. Now we need to understand that a voltage sensitive sodium channel will be locked in the inactivated state until the membrane voltage returns from plus 40 to minus 90 millivolts. In other words, a voltage sensitive sodium channel will remain locked in the inactivated state until the membrane undergoes repolarization. That is, the voltage should return from plus 40 to minus 90. We need the membrane to repolarize, and this will unlock the voltage sensitive sodium channel from the inactivated state. It will then return. To the closed state. So how does that happen? There are potassium channels that open up which cause potassium to uh, exit the cell and also acetylcholine will be metabolized by acetylcholine esterase. Once that happens, the configuration of the NM receptor returns to the closed uh, configuration and ions can no longer enter. This will cause the voltage of the interior of the cell to become more negative. Now when that happens, the voltage of the cell 
comes down from plus 40 and returns to minus 90. This is what we call repolarization. Now, where the negative charges inside the cell are now sufficient to attract the positive charges again and it will start pulling on the voltage sensitive sodium channel in such a way that the inactivation gate is squeezed out and it will have to open up and in doing so the activation gate closes completely and in this way the voltage sensitive sodium channel returns to the closed state. So, the voltage sensitive sodium channel started off in the closed state. From closed state, it changed to the open state in a voltage dependent manner. From open state, it immediately got inactivated in a time dependent manner. And the voltage sensitive sodium channel will remain locked and therefore useless in the inactivated state until the membrane repolarizes. Repolarization will help the voltage sensitive sodium channel to return to the closed state and only a closed voltage sensitive sodium channel can respond to a stimulus and open up again. So this would be a summary of what we have discussed till now. Okay, so now let us try to discuss the normal physiology of skeletal muscle contraction. The discussion sh shall follow these headings, half of which include excitation and the other half of which include contraction and we will see how both these processes are coupled. So there is the voltage sensitive sodium channel embedded in the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle, the sarcolemma. You can see the negative charges inside and at rest the potential of the membrane is negative, it's minus 90. The negative charges inside the cell effectively attract the positive charges inside the voltage sensitive sodium channel keeping it in a closed state. But when acetylcholine gets released and binds to NM receptors, it undergoes a conformational change causing positive ions to enter. The negativity is reduced and when that is reduced, the negative charges um, find it difficult to attract the positive charges inside the voltage sensitive sodium channel. The negativity inside the cell reduces from minus 90 to minus 40. That's what we call the threshold potential or the end plate potential and at that potential it can no longer attract the positive charges inside the voltage sensitive sodium channel. It starts changing its shape and the activation gate opens up. And when that happens, sodium rushes into the cell. The inside of the cell becomes extremely positive. That's what we call depolarization and if you measure the voltage, it will be around plus 40. In a time dependent manner, the inactivation gate will swing shut and close the central pore of the voltage sensitive sodium channel converting into the inactivated state and this voltage sensitive sodium channel will be locked in the inactivated state until the membrane voltage returns from plus 40 to minus 90 that is it has to undergo repolarization so for that to happen potassium channels open potassium moves out of the cell Acetylcholine gets metabolized by acetylcholine esterase and the NM receptor no longer permits cations from entering. The interior of the cell becomes more negative. The membrane potential, if measured, will now start showing a more negative value until it returns to minus 90. That's what we call repolarization. Now the negativity within the cell is powerful enough to attract the positive charges inside the voltage sensitive sodium channel. It starts changing its shape. The activation gate starts closing and the inactivation gate starts opening and ultimately the voltage sensitive sodium channel returns to the closed state.
So in this way, the action potential gets propagated because the NM receptor is present only at the neuromuscular junction. The perijunctional zone has got voltage sensitive sodium channels and these voltage sensitive sodium channels are present throughout the membrane and they will cause the action potential to propagate stimulating other voltage sensitive sodium channels along the way. Now you can see that there is an invagination of the cell membrane at this point. This is called the T-tubule of the skeletal muscle. And inside the T-tubules there are voltage sensitive calcium channels. And they, once stimulated by the action potential, they will open up and allow calcium to enter from the exterior into the cell. This particular voltage sensitive calcium channel is called a dihydropyridine receptor. So the dihydropyridine receptor is seen on the sarcolemma lemma and is activated by changes in voltage and once it opens it causes the opening of another receptor called the ryanodin receptor which is present on the sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane. So there's the dihydropyridine receptor in the T-tubule and here in blue is the sarcoplasmic reticulum which is obviously the storehouse of calcium inside the cell. Now the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum will have a calcium channel on its membrane and this calcium channel is what we call the ryanodin receptor. Now when the dihydropyridine receptor opens up causing calcium to enter. This triggers the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the sarcoplasm, otherwise called the cytoplasm of this skeletal muscle. And that calcium will leak out via the ryanodin receptors. So the ryanodin receptors are present on the sarcoplasmic reticular membrane. They are activated by the dihydropyridine receptors and they allow the flow of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the sarcoplasm. So this would be a um, skeletal muscle cell. This would be myosin filaments and those would be actin in yellow. The myosin heads are separated from actin by those black lines which you see. They are called tropomyosin. The tropomyosin molecules will have those black circles there called the troponin heads. So this entire unit is called a sarcomere which is the contractile unit of a skeletal muscle. So there we have the sarcoplasmic reticulum which has been stimulated and now releases calcium into the sarcoplasm. The released calcium will now bind to the troponin heads and when they bind to the troponin heads they, call, they cause lateral displacement of the tropomyosin. Now the myosin heads are in a position to interact with actin and when that happens it results in what is known as a power stroke and the net result is contraction of that sarcomia. When this happens throughout the skeletal muscle, the skeletal muscle contracts. So this is what we mean by excitation, contraction, coupling and it should be clear now how this process started and proceeded. Now, normally acetylcholine gets metabolized and is rapidly cleared from its binding site at the NM receptor. Succinylcholine is a depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agent. Like acetylcholine, it too binds to the NM receptor, brings about conformational change in the NM receptor and opens up the cationic channels. 
However, it does not get cleared rapidly from its binding site. So, those two molecules in red, those are succinylcholine molecules. As you can see, they do not get cleared rapidly from there. And this results in persistent depolarization of the neuromuscular junction. It is not allowed to repolarize. And failure of the membrane to repolarize means that the voltage sensitive sodium channels in the perijunctional zone will be locked in the inactivated state. No action potential will be allowed to propagate beyond this point. The skeletal muscle may contract initially with some fasciculations, but it ends up in a flaccid paralysis. So, neuromuscular blocking agents or peripherally acting skeletal muscle relaxants are classically classified in two depolarizing agents and non depolarizing agents. Depolarizing agents are partial agonists of NM receptors. There is only one example for this. It's known by three names succinylcholine, scholine, or succinylcholine. Non depolarizing agents are antagonists of NM receptors. They are competitive antagonists or concentration dependent antagonists of acetylcholine at the NM receptors. And there are plenty of examples for this. So, although strictly speaking, we can call succinylcholine a cholinergic agent, we do not classify succinylcholine as a cholinergic agent when we talk about cholinergic agents because strictly speaking it is a nicotinic agent. Similarly, non-depolarizing agents, we can classify them as anticholinergic because they block nicotinic receptors. But when we talk about anticholinergic drugs, we usually stress upon the anti-muscarinic drugs. The anti-nicotinic so-called anti-nicotinic drugs like these non-depolarizing agents are usually discussed separately. They are discussed together with general anesthetic agents and opioid agents simply because these drugs are used together um, in the operation theater, in the emergency department and in the ICU. So yes, if we look at the classification of anticholinergic drugs, it is true that we see these drugs. It is true that we see the non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents as being classified under nicotinic blockers. Uh, so yes, they are anticholinergic, but usually when we talk about anticholinergic drugs or anticholinergic effects, we usually emphasize on the anti-muscarinic 